Hello everyone, my name is Eugene. You're welcome to your Computing Systems YouTube channel. Uh, today we're going to have a look at how we can deploy a WDS server on Windows Server 2019. Uh, WDS Server has been around for a while. It was first introduced in Windows Server 2008. Uh, it was formerly known as Windows uh, Remote Installation Services. It's just a network-based installation service on Microsoft Windows. So uh, we're going to have a look at what it is and the requirements for deploying uh, WDS and then we're also going to have a demo on how to install WDS. There's a couple of steps involved that really get so many people confused but uh, I've done this for so many years so I hope this demonstration helps you learn how to deploy WDS server on your Windows Server operating systems. This procedure will work on Windows Server 2008 up to Windows Server 2019. So let's have a look at what WDS is. Okay, so it's a network service that was developed by Microsoft and basically what it does is that it allows us to deploy Windows operating system over a network. Now, if you are performing an installation for just one machine, uh, preparing a USB flash drive and using it for the installation or using a product DVD probably is the best way to do it. But what if you have 10 computers, how many USB flash drives are you going to prepare, or maybe 20 of them or 100 of them? You will need an automated way to do this. So, Windows deployment services just allow us to perform installations simultaneously uh, over a network. So, I can start like 10 installations at the same time from one network location, right? It's really, really cool. So, as you can see, the demo that we have over here, the image that we have over here, we have uh, one server. Right, that is performing an installation for multiple computers. So basically that is what this network service does. You can put an OS image on one server, it is a WDS server and deploy it to multiple computers at the same time. It speeds up the installation process and it makes it very, very easy. Now, let's have a look at the requirements for deploying WDS, right? Now, if you're going to perform WDS on a server that is on a production environment, you need a minimum 4 gig RAM if you're going to perform multiple installations from it. Um, but I have a server on my VM that has just 2 gig RAM, but you can just use 2 gig RAM to do it if you're just learning, right? But if you're going to put this on a production environment, you need 4 GB or more, right? The higher the RAM, the faster the, the, the server is going to work for you. And you need a 64-bit processor, obviously. And then you need a hard disk space, minimum 10 GB, depending on the operating system version that you are deploying over WDS. And then, some of the most important things that you will need to have in place before you deploy WDS is a PXC NIC, right? Your network interface card has to be PXC compliant. PSC compliant NIC just allows users to boot over a network, okay? So it can allow you to perform uh, a, boot, a network boot uh, with your computer. And most of the network adapters that were developed from 2010 upwards are already PSC compliant. So probably you already have a PSC compliant NIC on your server and on your client machine, so this will not be a problem. And then you need an OS image of the, the, the Windows operating system you want to deploy. And most importantly, it has to be in the WIM format or the WIM format. I'll show you how this is. And then you also need a domain naming system, a GACP network service, an Active Directory domain controller or Active Directory domain services, and then a hard disk that is having an NTFS file system. So, so without wasting time, we're going to get straight into the demo. And I'm going to take you through step by step how you can deploy WDS server on your Windows Server 2019 operating system. And as I've said earlier on, this can work on any Windows Server operating system from Windows Server 2008 up to Windows Server 2019. So the procedure is not only for Server 2019, but I'm going to use Windows Server 2019 to do this. All right. Now, I'm going to perform this demonstration on a virtualization platform. My favorite virtualization platform is VM Workstation. I've used it for quite some time and it's really fun. So, I have Windows Server 2019 over here on my virtual machine. As you can see, it has a 2 GB memory and two processors 
a 60 gigabyte hard disk and a couple of things over here right now if you're familiar with the use of vmware you realize that i've set my network adapter to vmware 2 right you can change this if you're not comfortable with this particular virtual network adapter but the vmnet that we have on vmware workstation is like switches now when you go to the workplace or any office all the computers over there normally are connected to the same network switch right so if you have a virtual platform like mine and you want your computers to intercommunicate with each other you have to make sure they are all having their network adapters configured to the same vmnet not necessarily vmnet 2 so if you want to change it when the machine is off you can just double click here and change it from this side where you have a custom specific network right you can change it to any vmnet that you want the exception of this and that for what we are about to do all right now i'm going to power on this machine and then i'll press control insert key if you're using vmware and you see press control delete on your virtual machine you don't press control or delete if you press control or delete it's going to lock your host machine screen so you press control or insert now i'm going to log in here with my password now once the server finished booting the first thing that you need to do is to make sure you check ip addresses ip addresses always comes first i have recorded a video on tcp ip version 4 and tcp ip version 6 on youtube if you want more knowledge about these two versions of tcp ip you can go watch it but the first thing i'm going to do is to make sure my ip address for this machine is all right because computers and computing devices communicate over tcp ip if your ip address is not well configured whatever you're going to do is going to be in vain because it's not going to work so i'm going to make sure my ip address is okay there's a little pop-up that comes here about the windows admin center okay i'm going to just click here to make sure it doesn't show up again this is my server manager server manager is where we basically do most of our configurations on windows server operating systems nowadays so i'm going to be working here a lot but the first thing I'm going to do is to set my IP address and to make things easy I'm not going to go through any complicated process I'm going to just click on local server over here when you click on local server you realize that uh, my server's name my server name is not properly configured and I mean Monrovia time zone time zones can really really mess up network services so I'm going to make sure my time zone is well set and then I'll set my IP address and configure my host name then we begin the rest of the configuration so to set my time zone i'll just click on utc here time zone option here i'm in monrovia time zone i mean ghana specifically but we use monrovia uh, time zone so i'm going to click time zone here change time zone and then go to time zone change it to monrovia UTC 00 Monrovia okay and then go okay and then I'll make sure the time is correct it's 348 here so this seems like an irrelevant thing when you are doing network services most people ignore time but I don't because I know the kind of mess the wrong time can cause for your network so you always make sure your time is correct because I've been my, because I found myself in a situation whereby uh, wrong time has caused uh, an internet uh, instability uh, before. So just need to make sure that time is correct. Okay, so I'm going to set my IP address by clicking on the Internet Zero option over here. I'm going to right click on my network adapter, go properties, and then I'll click on IP version 4 properties here and I'll set an IP address for this machine I'm going to use a class A private IP address so I'm going to type 10.0.0.1 here and then I don't have any default gateways so I'm going to leave the site blank uh, default gateways are used when you have uh, routers or modems or any edge device on the network but I don't have such a thing on the virtual platform so I'll leave that site blank now 
uh, the DNS option over here, I'm going to set the same IP address here over here because the DNS server is going to run on this machine, right? If your DNS server is going to be on a different machine, you have to use the IP address of that machine as your preferred DNS server, right? But my DNS server is going to run, run right here. So I'll type 10.0.0.1 here. I only have one DNS server, so I don't need to fill the blanks over here. I'm going to go OK, close, right? My IP address is well configured now. The next thing I'm going to do is that I'm going to make sure my computer name is, looks good. It's not mandatory, but I always like to keep a clean sheet when it comes to configuration. Um, so I'm going to click on computer name here. And then I'll go to change and then change my server name. I'm going to call this server SRV1. And then for the sake of the DNS configuration that we're going to do, I'm going to click more here and then also set a DNS suffix, right? So the DNS suffix is basically the DNS domain space you're going to use for your network. So I'm going to use ucomputing.net, so I'll type here ucomputing.net. Okay. Go okay. This is the proper way to configure DNS server ahead of the VDS deployment. Okay. If you don't want to do this, probably you're going to encounter errors somewhere. But you know, not to be on the safer side, I like doing this. So I'm going to click OK here. I don't touch the site. I just click more and change the DNS suffix. I'll go OK here. Click OK. Click close. And allow the computer to restart by clicking restart now. After the restart is complete, uh, the server manager is going to load again. Now, there is a way that you can stop the server manager from reloading every time that you boot your machine. So let's have a look at how we can stop this from always popping up. You can just click on Manage here, and then we have server manager properties. If you don't want it to show every time you boot your machine, you just check the site. Then go. Okay, now it's not going to rest it's not going to show up again when we restart our system. So I'm going to just begin by configuring the network services that are required. Already we have a PXE compliant NIC, we have a hard disk that has an NTFS file system. So I'm going to begin by installing DNS and DACP in addition with Active Directory. Then we can put the WDS on top. So I'm going to click Add Rules and Features here. This is not a DNS uh, video tutorial. I already have a DNS uh, video tutorial. So if you want to take your time and study how to install DNS and DSCP, there's a video for it on our channel. You can go watch it. But I'm going to speed my way through here by clicking Next here and go for Rule Base or Feature Base Installation Next. I'll select the server name, go Next. And then I'm going to check DNS server. I'll click Add Features here. Go Next. Go Next. Go Next. And then go for the Install button. All right. After the installation is complete for DNS, uh, the rest is just configuration. So we're going to go to DNS here on the server manager. Right-click on the server name and go to DNS Manager. Now, you can use this option. You can also pass through the site. You can click on Tools here and access DNS. Once the DNS console is opened, you can go ahead and configure it. There are two nodes here that are very, very important. The FOIL lookup zone node and then the reverse lookup zone node. So you just need to make sure these two is well configured and then test it to make sure the name resolution system is working properly before you go ahead and add the DACP and Active Directory. So I'm going to configure it real quick and then move on. So I'm going to right click on for lookup zone here, click new zone, go next. And then this is the first DNS server on our network. So I'm going to make sure it's a primary zone.
The explanation for all these ones have been given already in my DLS video, so you can go watch it if you want detailed information about this. But I'll select primary zone here, go next, and then set the zone name. Now, you remember before we got here, uh, we set something that we call a DNS suffix earlier on, which is ucomputing.net. So it has to be the same, right? That one is not optional. So I'll say ucomputing.net here and then go next. Specify, create a new file with this name, go next. Select allow both secure and non secure dynamic updates, go next. And then click finish. Now, once this is done, this zone here, ucomputing.net, have to have three DNS resource records. If it's less than three, there's a problem. You need to fix it before you proceed. Now, the reverse lookup zone is also important for name resolution, so I'm going to right click here, go new zone, click next. Now, this zone two is the first one on our network. The reverse lookup zone here is the first on our network. So, I'm going to make sure it's a primary zone, go next here. And then I'm running on a TCP IP version 4 network. So I'm going to select TCP IP version 4, reverse lookup zone, next. And then place my network ID in here. The IP address that we used for the server is 10.0.0.1. So the network ID is going to be 10. Just because we have three fields here doesn't mean you have to put everything in there. That is wrong. Okay, so I'm going to go next. Make sure it's create a new file with the name above, go next. Select allow both secure and non-secure dynamic updates. Click next and click finish. Now, when you finish configuring any typical DNS server, you're supposed to have three resource records in the forward lookup zone and three resource records in the reverse lookup zone. Now, as you can see, we have two here and then three here. That is a problem that we need to fix, else our DNS server will not work properly. So I'll select ucomputing.net here, double click this zone name and just check update associated pointer record and go ok. Once I do that and click the reverse lookup zone over here and refresh, we have three resource records. Right, everything is cool. Now, to test whether the name resolution system is working properly, I'll just press the video key plus R, type CMD here, press enter and then launch command line to call NS lookup. Right. When I type NS lookup and go for the enter key, I'm supposed to get a result like this, right? The fully qualified domain name of this cell. The host name plus the domain name. If you run this command after you set up your DNS server ahead of the VDS and you see unknown over here, you need to resolve it before you proceed. You're gonna have issues. Alright. Now DNS is ready. I'm going to go ahead and configure DHCP real quick. So I'm going to go to dashboard again from my server manager. Click add rules and features. Go next here. Select rule base or feature based installation. Go next. Select my server name. Go next. And then I'll check DHCP server. Click add features. Go next. Right. Go next again, next again, and go install. Okay, once the DSP server row is done installing, we need to configure it and test it whether it works properly. So I'm going to click close here and then go ahead and click on tools and click on PSP. Right? So once the DSP console is loaded, I'm going to just move this here a bit. And expand this server node over here. I'm going to go ahead to select IPv4 node over here. Right click and say new scope. Again, I have a video tutorial on DACP, so if you want to take your time and get more explanation on DACP server configuration, you can watch that video. I'm going to click next here and just type a scope name. All right, any scope name works, but I'll call this one WDS um, scope. Description is not mandatory, so I'm going to go next here and then specify where the IP addresses should start from and where it should end. I'm going to start from 10.0.0.1 
and let it end at 10 to 0 to 0 dot, let's say 20. I just have a few machines. But if you have more, you can you can just let it issue more IP addresses. I'll go next here. And then because I said it should start from 10.0.0.1, when I move here, I'm going to say you should exclude that IP address because don't forget we have already set that IP address manually or statically to this server. So if we let DACP start issuing IP addresses from 10.0.0.1, there's going to be an IP conflict and our WDS server is going to be offline. So I'm going to say 10.0.0.1 add to the exclusion range so that our DSCP server will start issuing IP addresses from 10.0.0.2. So I'll go next here, leave this default, go next, leave this default, go next, and then I'll just make sure the DNS details, everything here is set right. And I'll go next here, go next, and then it's giving me the option to activate the scope. Right. Activating the scope is just about letting the DSCP start working right away. So if we want it to start leasing IP addresses right away, we have to just leave this radio button on. So I'll go finish here and then click refresh. Right. You're supposed to have a green check mark over here that indicates that the DSCP server has started working nicely. Now if the DSCP server leases that IP addresses out, it's supposed to be recorded over here. So we test the DSCP server to make sure it's working properly because if the DSCP server is not working properly, our WDS server will malfunction. So we test it ahead of time before we even bring that network service. So I have one Windows 7 machine over here on my virtual platform. I'll just make sure it's sharing the same VMnet as this one. Don't forget about the VMnet. I said the VMnet are like virtual switches. So the Windows Server machine, as you can see, is on VMnet 2. So I need to make sure this one is also on VMnet 2, and it is. If yours is not on VMnet 2, you can just make sure you double click here. You can double click here, and then just make sure you switch to VMnet 2. Or if you want to use VMnet 0 or something else, you just need to make sure the machines on the virtual platform are all on the same VMnet. Just like if you are at a workplace, the machines have to all be connected to the same switch or the same wireless access point. All right. Now I'm going to move this machine over here to test my DSP server and make sure it's working. If our DSP server over here is working properly, by the time this Windows 7 machine gets to even the lock on screen, Mm, it has to record here that it has obtained an IP address from the DSP server. So I'm going to just log in here. Okay, the Windows 7 machine is on. I'm going to just refresh here to see if, yes, the DSP server is leasing the IP addresses. It has given the Windows 7 machine 10.0.0.2. So it shows that the DSP is working properly. Right. So let's move on. I'm going to just shut this machine down. Okay, close. So our DNS is working fine. Our DSP is working fine. We need to make sure we add Active Directory domain services. Right. If you already have some on your network while you're deploying WDS, it's fine. You just need to make sure you cross check DNS, DSP, Active Directory, make sure they are working fine before you add a WDS to it. Okay. So I don't have it, so I'm going to deploy it real quick. I'm going to click on Add Rules and Features over here. Go next. Select Rule Base or Feature Base Installation. Go next. Select my server name here. Go next. And then what I'm looking for is uh, Active Directory Domain Services. So I'll check and click Add Features. Go next, next, install. It is that easy. Okay, once the ADDS server row is done installing, we're going to use this blue link over here to promote the server to become a domain controller. Okay, you can click here, or if mistakenly, for some reason, you just click here to close, 
you can still click on this flag over here in server manager and you still get access to the blue link and click on pro promote this server to the domain controller okay it's going to give you a wizard and then you need to go for add a new forest if you don't have any domain controller in your network or you don't have any active directory domain on your network you are setting up a new domain from scratch you need to go for add a new forest okay and go for root domain now the or the domain name for the active directory domain has to match the DNS name. So our DNS domain name space is ucomputing.net. So we're going to use the same thing as the root domain name for our HDS. So I'm going to type ucomputing.net here and I'll click next. All right. For the default here, yeah, okay. I'm going to give a detailed explanation of this when I record Active Directory Domain Services video. But you need to set something I would call a directory restore mode password, which is not the same as the password of this machine, okay? You can set a different password, but this password is very important for ADDS, okay? So you don't write it and forget, you write it and document, because later, when you are doing maintenance, you need it, okay? So, I'm going to just type a password in here. It just has to be a complex password. So it has to be at least eight characters minimum, and it has to contain alphabets, numbers, symbols, uppercases, and lowercases. Okay. If the password matches, this option over here for the next button will be active. If it doesn't match, this is how it's going to look. So just watch out for this. I'll click next and then I'll clear this checkbox for create DNS delegation. Go next. Okay, it's gonna give me a NetBIOS name. It's fine, I'm gonna go next. Okay, I'll go next again. Go next again. It's checking the requirements for deploying ADDS. If everything goes right, it will tell us that all prerequisite checks pass successfully. Right. Click install to begin. So I'm going to go for install button here. And the ADDS domain controller will be installed and then configure. This is going to take a while, so I'll let it run. And then afterwards, we continue. Okay, after everything, the computer is going to restart. Normally, this is a normal behavior for an ADDS installation. So I'll let it restart and then afterwards we we'll continue with the WDS setup. Okay, so remember we configured the server manager not to load as startup. So the server manager will not load anymore. We have to launch it if we need to use it. So I'm going to click on start here and then open the server manager. Right. Once the server manager is loaded, we need to now go ahead and install the Windows Deployment Services server room. Okay. Now, it is not recommended to put your OS images for WDS on the same drive as your Windows Server Operating System. This is what I mean. When you go to the File Explorer over here, you will see that we have, when you click on this PC, you already have a drive in this system, right? It's not recommended to put your OS images on this drive. So we have to add an additional storage and then place our uh, OS images for our WDS server on it. So basically what we need to do is that we need to connect an additional hard drive, right? So I'm going to add an additional hard drive here real quick. On VMware, if you want to add, Add an additional drive is very easy. You leave the full screen mode, you just double click on the hard drive icon over here, and then you go click on add here, select hard drive, go next. SCSI is fine. Next, you go create a new virtual disk. Next, store as a single file. You can make this one a little bit bigger. By just adding one over here, 160 GB. Now, 
once you have not checked this box, this 160 GB will not be subtracted from your total hard disk storage. So don't be scared. You can even give up to 500 GB. If you don't have space, it's fine. Okay, but it will not just allow you to use beyond the beyond limit. So uh, let's move on. I'm going to click on next here. Click on finish. Now I'm going to go OK here. If this were to be a physical server, probably you need to open up the chassis and install additional hard drives, right? But this is VMware, so we get a hard drive for free. <laughs> All right. Now the hard drive is connected. How do we format it with NTFS? Because we have learned earlier on from the prerequisite that the hard drive that is going to store WTS OS images must have an NTFS file system. So from server manager, this is what you need to do. You click on files and storage services over here, and then you go for the disks node over here. Now when you click on disks, it's going to pop open an option for us, and you see that uh, our 160 GB hard drive is here but it's offline, it's not having a partitioning style so we're going to right click on it and say bring online click yes and then we're going to right click on it and say initialize and go for yes right now once we go for yes it's going to initialize the disk with a GPT partitioning style right so I'm going to right click on this again and go for new volume go next select my hard disk Go next. I can partition it with all the 160 GB is fine. Go next. Uh, the drive letter E is OK. I'll go next. And then the most important thing you need to make sure the drive is formatted with NTFS file system. That is the most important thing. I'll go next here and click create. It's going to format the drive with NTFS file system and make it ready to accept WDS OS images. I'll click close here. And then you can just verify if the drive is loaded by clicking File Explorer. This PC, we have a 160 GB drive formatted with NTFS file system ready for us. So I'll click on Close and then come back to the dashboard. Right. Once I click on the dashboard, we have all the prerequisites in place DNS, DSCP, Active Directory, a storage that is having an NTFS file system, WDS deployment is ready to go. So I'm going to click on Add Rules and Features over here. Click Next. Select Rule Based or Feature Based Installation. Go Next. Select my server name. Go Next. And then we have Windows Deployment Services over here. I'll check this box. Click Add Features. Click Next. 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 And then these two most important rule services, Deployment Server and Transport Server, must be checked okay by default so you just make sure all the checkboxes are gone are on and then you click on next and then you click on install here give it a moment to finish installing then we start configuring okay once the installation is complete i'm going to click on close here and then we have the bds server row over here i'm going to click tools over here and then for Windows Deployment Services, right? I'll click on Windows Deployment Services and then explore the user interface. Okay, I'm going to expand servers. This one server over here with an exclamation on it is a normal behavior. So the reason why we have the exclamation on it is because it's not configured. So I'm going to right click on it here and say Configure Server. When I go Configure Server, it's going to prompt me again that we need to make sure a PXC compliant NIC is available on the server and the client machines. We have DNS server available. We have NTFS storage available to store the OS images for WDS and ADDS. Okay, if you are going to perform a standalone deployment. So everything is set for us to proceed. So I'm going to click on next here. And then let us have Active Directory integrated. Uh, deployment so because we have DNS and we have Active Directory available so I'll go next here and then it's telling me it's going to put the remote installation images the OS images on C drive which is not recommended so I'm going to change the drive letter over here to E that means that anytime you are loading OS images it should go to this hour drive right I'm going to click close here 
and change the drive letter to E. And then go next here. All right, I'm going to play these two checkboxes over here. Do not listen on DSCP and DSCP version says, but DSCP is what we're going to use for this work. So I'm going to play this checkbox and it's going to configure proxy stuff we don't need. I'm going to play these two checkboxes and go next. And it's going to give me three options over here to respond to any client, known client, or all client. All right. So I'm going to go for this third option over here, respond to all client computers, known and unknown computers, and then just instruct it to require administrative approval for unknown computers. So if someone tries to maybe use my OS image on my WDS server because it's licensed, uh, it's going to prompt him or her for administrative credentials, which is a good security feature that Microsoft placed in there for us. So I'm going to go next here and allow this to finish. Once it's done, it's going to give us this notification over here. It's nothing to worry about. I'm going to click finish here. And then it loads this note over here for me. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and just right click. Over here and then start the network service, right? I'm gonna go start and go okay, right? You just need to make sure the network service for WDS is started. Now, the most important thing you need to keep in mind is that we have these two nodes over here. You need to add install images and boot images before you can use it to perform the installation. There's an additional option to create a multicast transmission if you want, but the most important thing is these two over here. Okay, so first of all, we're gonna try adding images over here. Now, what is a boot image and what is an install image? How do I even figure it out? Now, every Windows operating system has these two images, a boot image and an install image. So I'm going to mount a Windows 10 operating system or connect a Windows 10 operating system to this machine. I do have one here. So I'm going to double click on this CD icon and click on Browse here. Go look for Windows 10 Enterprise. I think I have Windows 10 Enterprise okay, on my disk. I'm going to go for that. Check Connected. Go OK. And then go full screen. Now I'm going to verify if this CD is loaded in my system by going to this PC. Okay, it shows that the Windows 10 Enterprise operating system is loaded. All right. Now there's a folder in every Microsoft Windows Server operating system or Windows operating systems in general called Sources, and this is where you have the boot.win file. And then install the twenty file you need for your WDS. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and just right click on this and say add boot image. I browse and go select this PC. Open my operating system, product DVD, open the sources folder. Now we have boot.win, we have install.win, but I'm adding a boot image, so I'm going to go for boot.win, open, next. It's not mandatory to keep the name, you can change it. So I'm going to call this U Windows Setup, right? I'll just put a U here so that we know our installation or our configuration works. So I'll call this U Windows Setup, it's fine. I'll go next here. Go next and allow it to load the boot.win file. Now, it's going to just basically copy the boot.win file from our OS uh, product DVD to the E drive that we specified for our OS images. All right, so it's loaded. I'm going to click finish here and then I'm going to go to install images, right click here and say add install image fine you can create an image group before you do this but when you go for the top button it gives you the option to create the image group anyway 
So I'm going to call this one U image group or U group is fine. And then go next here and browse here to go look for my installed upstream file for my operating system. I'm going to go open here, go next, and then again gives me the option to maintain the default name or use a different name. I'm going to clear this checkbox and call this one U Windows 10. All right. Call this one U Windows 10. U Windows 10. Go next here. Go next here. It's going to check the integrity of the image just to make sure there is nothing corrupted in there. But afterwards, it's going to transfer it to the E drive where the OS images are kept. I'm going to click finish over here. Now you can see we have an image group with the uh, U Windows 10 in it and a boot image here. U Windows setup. Right now, sometimes if you don't create a multicast transmission for your WDS, it doesn't really work. These are all the errors that we normally encounter. But when you finish adding an install image and a boot image, you can test the deployment if it works. If it works, there's no need to worry yourself about multicast transmission. But if it doesn't, you add a multicast transmission to make it work. And then there's also one thing that you need to watch out for. You just need to make sure the service is always started. If there's a black box over here showing that the service is stopped, the WDS will not work. And then most importantly, WDS is highly dependent on DSCP. So before you even allow your client to initiate an installation process over the network, you need to make sure you check your DSCP, make sure it's looking good. Now let's check the DSCP for the last time. I'm going to click on tools over here. Okay, I'm going to check DSCP for the last time to make sure it's looking good. Now there's a behavior of DSCP that you should watch out for. That's why I'm taking you here again. I'm going to go to DSCP and then I'm going to expand this. When you expand the server node, you see that there's this red drop down arrows over here. It's not looking good. It's not supposed to be like this. It's supposed to show green check mark here, green check mark here. And we have something in DSCP called DSCP authorization, right? Anytime it sense that there's a, an active directory domain controller around, it stops working, right? Because it needs authorization to operate. So, in order for it, this to come back to normal, you just need to right click on the server name here and go to authorize and just refresh to make sure the green check marks come back again, else the other BTS server will not respond. All right. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and test the WDS server, closing the DSP console and my server manager. Everything is set. Let's give it a try. I'm going to just set up one machine here. I'm going to create a new machine. Using virtualization is fun. <laughs> you can have a machine anytime you want. Okay, so I'm going to create a new machine over here. This is a typical approach that we use in creating machines in VMware. So I'm going to go for typical, next. I'll select, I'll install operating system later, next. Select Microsoft, Windows 10. You're doing a Windows 10 installation, so. This is okay. I'll go next here. I'll leave all. I'm going to leave the default name. Go next. I'll just make sure I've stored the hard disk as a single file. Go next. And then there is something here. You see this thing over here? The network adapter must be connected to VMNet 2. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to click on customize hardware here. Click on network adapter and make sure this is on the same virtual switch or VMNet as that of the server, else the communication will not work. So I'll click finish here. We have a new machine on our virtual platform. There is no CD connected. There is no flash drive connected. So we're going to boot it and force it to boot from the network, right? Uh, on some Dell machines, when you press F12, it triggers the boot menu. HP, sometimes it's escape, sometimes it's F2, sometimes it's F10, depending on your your key, your hot key for triggering your boot menu. You just press on whatever key that will trigger the boot menu and just force it to boot from the network adapter. Right. 
So let's start the first one. I'm going to boot this machine. There is an annoying pop up. I'm going to click over here. Okay. Once it boots, I'm going to just force the boot menu to pop up. Okay. Once it comes up, I'm going to just tell the system to boot from the network. Right. If you're using the Dell machine and you press F12, it'll bring the boot menu. If you're doing it in a production environment, please check which key is used to trigger the boot menu on your client machines. Okay, but on VMware it's escape, so I press escape and it brought this. So I'm going to select network by pressing enter. It's going to try and query the DSCP server for an IP. Once it gets it, it will tell me to press enter. I'll press enter. It has started loading the setup for my installation. So if I have another machine, I could just repeat the same thing. It will begin the installation, load the setup from the server. I can start my third machine, boot from the network, fourth machine, boot from the network, up to 100 machines, 200 machines. They will all be simultaneously pulling the setup for the installation from my WGS server and everything will work fine. I don't need to take or borrow 100 pen drives because I'm doing 100 different installations at the same time. WDS can fix this. Okay, so we'll wait for it to load for a bit and then begin the installation to see that nothing went wrong. When the deployment services wizard pops up and we click next, it will tell us to provide domain admin credentials. So I'm gonna say administrator, I'll type my domain admin credentials and I'll enter in here my domain admin password go OK and it gives me access to the images on the WDS server. U Windows 10. Do you remember this? The description to is U Windows 10. Everything is looking good. I'm going to click next here and it gives me the chance to format my hard drive. You can click next, go we'll format it and proceed. Just like a normal installation but there's no cd in here there's no flash drive in here i can begin this installation on multiple machines at the same time and we will not have any problem okay thank you very much for watching i hope you enjoyed this video 